Hello and welcome. My name is Kari. I am a stay-at-home mom to now four kiddos and this is the birth story of our fourth child. If you did not see my previous pregnancy update video, please go check that out. Um, but I'll give a quick recap in case you have not seen that video. I was in my fourth pregnancy. I've had all vaginal births prior to this, and my last birth was a home birth, and that was our plan for this child. Um, unfortunately, I wound up with a high-risk pregnancy with a condition called placenta previa. And so I went into my anatomy scan and everything looked great. There was no placenta previa noted. And then at 30 weeks, I had my first bleed. And within that two week time frame between 30 and 32 weeks, I bled four times, four separate times. I was hospitalized. And during my hospital stay, I received steroid shots to help develop the baby's lungs in case we were going to have to deliver him sooner rather than later. And I found out that I had the most extreme version of placenta previa, which if you can imagine my hand being the cervical opening and this placenta covering completely over. So not only could I um, not have a home birth, I could not even have a vaginal birth. So I switched from my midwife over to an OB practice at the regional hospital that offered a level four NICU and all of the specialists to ensure that we could have the safest delivery possible. And so I was put on pelvic rest after my stay. I was only there for a few days. And thankfully, after that, after those four bleeds between weeks 30 and 32, I did not have any more bleeds. We really thought we were in the clear, and I had my C-section scheduled for exactly 37 weeks, so I was really hoping that our little guy would have a really good fighting chance. So I was forewarned that despite having the steroid shots, he might still have respiratory distress syndrome and uh, need a lot of therapy and might need a NICU stay. So we weren't sure how long that NICU stay would be or what that would look like. It all just really is up in the air when you have something like placenta previa. You're at a high risk for hemorrhaging and preterm labor. Um, and because of the hemorrhaging, you, you also have a risk of having to have a hysterectomy as well as the C-section. And so I went into it not even knowing if I would be able to have any more children after this, which was devastating, just heartbreaking to think that we're not even sure that we are done having kids, but I might not even have the choice anymore. Um, so that was very hard. Um, as it was, I was put on pelvic rest. I went home and my mom and my mother-in-law were both on call for us. So they, one of them was always physically here with us in case we had to run to the hospital. And for that entire month, I did not bleed. I was not doing anything. I was on the couch reading for an hour and I stood up, walked to the kitchen. And the next thing I know, I feel the blood pouring down my legs. And to say that was frightening is an absolute understatement um, because the thing with the bleeding is that you never know when it's gonna, if it's gonna stop. If, it, if it'll stop, when it'll stop, how much you're gonna lose before you can make it into the hospital. And because I was already about 35 weeks at this point, I knew that any bleed, no matter how small, was significant enough to go to the hospital. So, we had someone come over and we left for the hospital as soon as we could. Within about 45 minutes, we had made it and the bleeding had thankfully slowed down by that point. However, I never did stop. I It slowed down so that it was almost like a light period. So my husband and I uh, stayed at the hospital and I again, I was about, I was 35 weeks at this point, I think exactly. And um, we knew at that point that I would be staying at the hospital until this baby was born. Um, and I had a feeling that it would, we would not make it to his C-section date. I was really thinking that we would be able to make it at least a few more days. As it was um, on the second night inpatient, um, again, I don't know why it always happens in the evenings. <laughs> Just as we turned out the lights to go to bed, <laughs> I feel the gush. I feel that familiar 
warm gush and I just started shaking. Those post birth shakes that you get that are so uncontrollable and it's like your whole body is just uncontrollably shaking. That's what happened. And it was probably my nerves at that point. I knew somewhere in my heart that this was it. This was my son was going to be born tonight. I immediately called the nurse who immediately just one look under the sheet she said, Oh, we're going to get the doctor here. And within 30 seconds, that doctor was there taking a look and saying, yep, tonight is the night. Let's do this. And I was trying my best to stay very calm um, as best as we can, because this was an unplanned C-section. This ended up being an emergency C-section, but it was thankfully under controlled circumstances because we were already in the hospital. And this is why it's so important to take placenta previa seriously because you could have no bleeds, no symptoms at all, and then wind up with a bleed that lands you in the emergency C-section. Um, or you could be like me where you bleed on and off and then you are in and out of the hospital and you don't know which bleed is serious enough to get in that C-section. Um, every bleed, that I was getting just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Like I didn't know how much worse we could get. And so the doctor walked out and all of the nurses and the anesthesiologist rushed in and it was all very disorienting because, you know, I'm just in my PJs and they're trying to, they're putting my hair up in the net. They're shaving me down here. I've literally got about six different nurses on either side of me working. And then another nurse in front of me asking questions like intake stuff. And we didn't have time to really even think about what was going on. My husband was handed his scrubs and was told, you know, we were going to be separated now. So they wheeled me out of the room. So during the prep, my husband was not allowed in there. Um, that is pretty standard practice. The anesthesiologist is trying to get the IVs going. And then once they've got those, they're trying to do the spinal and you got to stay very still and everyone's yelling and it just seemed it was so chaotic there was no music there was no like the c-sections that are planned where you can schedule like how you want things set up or the music that you want playing or none of that happened it was just all hands on deck get this baby out as fast as possible i was throwing up during the surgery and that did not feel good but they didn't have to put me under. Um, sometimes if you start panicking and things, they have to go ahead and put you under. And I did not want that. I did not want to miss the birth of my son. And so I managed to hold it together. And I actually remember the anesthesiologist was next to my head and not for the whole surgery either, which I am dumbfounded about because everyone, everyone has told me that the anesthesiologist will be by my side the entire surgery and he was not. He was up and down the whole surgery. So I'm not sure why that really um, scared me that he wasn't there the entire surgery. But in any case, on, on, <laughs> on one hand, I was trying to distract myself and it was before my husband could really could come in. And so I brought up uh, what his personality type was. I was saying um, my Meyer Briggs personality type to him and what is yours? And he just looked at me and was like, are you a psychologist? And I said, no, <laughs> like in my head, I'm like, does it matter that I just answer the question? What's your, what's your uh, type? And he just laughed and walked away. And I was trying to, you know, engage in conversation that was going to distract me and from what was going on. Um, so he left, my husband was called in and my husband, according to him, they had already started the surgery. They had already made the first incision by the time my husband got in the room, which is again, not what we hear. We always hear they don't make the first incision until your, your partner is there with you. So we were kind of upset about that as well. We didn't have a clear drape to see what was going on. The doctors did not talk to us during the surgery to let us know where they were at in the process. So all I heard from the doctors was there were two two surgeons working together and they were just shooting the crap. You know, they were talking about um, where they like to ride their motorcycles. And it, I just felt so cheapened. So um, within 45 minutes of that bleed starting, my son was born.
they lifted him up so I could see him. And the first moment I saw him, I just, you know, on one hand, you feel extremely re relieved because, okay, he's crying. So you think, okay, this is great. You know, he looks good. He's a good size. He was six pounds. And aside from him crying and having apparent good weight on him, he was very pale. So that blood that I lost had um, affected his own blood count. And so he was um, anemic. And that is something else that you want to watch out for if you have this condition because you will lose blood. Losing blood during pregnancy can affect and will affect your baby. I was taking my iron tablets very religiously and thankfully by the time I had gotten up to delivery my iron was like 12.5 which is a very good place to start from because you are going to lose a lot of blood. Technically I did hemorrhage during this process during the c-section between the blood prior and then the c-section but because my iron was in such a good place to start um, I didn't need a blood transfusion. So I think it ended up going down to a nine from a 12.5 to a nine. So I think it's around seven where they say, okay, we need to do a blood transfusion. So I did not need to have the blood transfusion. I did not have to have a hysterectomy, thankfully, because the placenta was easily detached from the uterus. Um, if it had not been easily attached, then it would have been a placenta uh, creta, which is when it's uh, buried a little bit too deep into the uterine wall. And again, this is part of just having placenta previa. You have these other risks that are involved because of it. And so thankfully, I did not have to have a hysterectomy. However, it was very clear from even my eyes, and I didn't even have my glasses on, that my son was very pale and he was brought directly over to the little warming bassinet. Not taken to me. I didn't get to see him at all because all I see are these big drapes um, in front of me as they're finishing me up and stitching me up and getting me closed up. So I tell my husband, to, nobody's telling us what's going on with my son. So I tell my husband to go over there to leave me so that he can bring me an update because there I wasn't getting an update and I wanted to know right now what the status was with my son. And it was an excruciating 15, 20 minutes as they finished stitching me up. And only then was I able to get the first look at my son. So it took at least 15 or 20 minutes before I could even touch him. And they had him, by the time I saw him, he was already wrapped up in all of the equipment that he needed, like the CPAP and everything. So it was so hard to just see your newborn baby and they're, they're already attached to all these instruments and these tubes. That was my first real look at my son. And, um, and that's very hard as a parent the nurse holding him and you're not allowed to hold him. And I got 30 seconds with my son. Um, I got to touch his hand and give him a kiss before he was taken to the NICU. It wasn't until 24 hours after my son was born that I was able to hold him for the first time. And then it was another 48 hours or so before I could hold him again. And he ended up staying in the NICU for 10 days. And uh, every day that passes is an eternity when your child is in the NICU. Um, but I won't go into details about everything with the NICU stay. That is his story and not mine to share with the world. Um, all I can say is that as a parent, seeing your newborn baby in the NICU in someone else's hands and not getting to bathe him for the first time, not getting to do skin on skin until a week post birth, not getting to be the first one to give him a bottle, not being able to breastfeed for a few days. I think I finally got to latch him on on day five of his NICU stay. Having to leave him at the hospital, those are all very, very hard things that are possible if you have this condition that your baby might be in the NICU for a little while. And um, that's not to say that if you have this condition that that's what will happen because I was on a forum with other moms who were diagnosed with this condition as well. And they had wonderful C-sections. They had them at their planned time and the baby was born early but healthy and needed no NICU time. So there really is such a wide array of experiences 
with placenta previa. And of course, the, the thing now that we are keeping in mind, my husband and I, is that if we do choose to have more children, this is uh, poses a higher risk for us. I am at a higher risk for developing it all over again and then having to have another C-section. And if you've had a C-section before, in addition to the placenta previa, it's like a double whammy. So that might end up leading you to develop even more critical conditions like the placenta accreta that I spoke about earlier, where you would have to have a hysterectomy. All in all, it is a pretty frightening experience if you're symptomatic, um, even if you're asymptomatic, um, because it could come, the bleeding comes on a dime and you could never predict when it comes. But as you get further along in pregnancy, that's how it tends to go. So <laughs> I hope that if you have been diagnosed with placenta previa, that your placenta moves out of the way so that you can have a trial of labor and maybe a vaginal, if that is your choice, if that is what you want to do. And I hope that even if that's not how it goes and your birth doesn't go as planned, that, that you can find peace with um, how the birth of your child happened and, and everything that you experienced as a parent. Um, and that's why I wanted to create these videos about placenta previa, about my experiences, because when I was still pregnant, I know I was just trying to find all of the experiences that I could to to gain an understanding of what the wide range of experiences could look like. Like, what can I expect? What are the worst case scenarios? And really the worst case scenario is that you run into an emergency C-section and you have to have a hysterectomy and your baby is super preterm and needs to be in the NICU. And the best case scenario is that you're asymptomatic and you can go until your scheduled C-section date at about 37 weeks or so and there's no NICU time and you go home with your baby. So I hope that that um, provided you guys some insight and helped any of you. If you have your own story to share, please, please, please leave it down in the comments so that other mothers can read them and um, feel some sense of community um, because it can be a real trying time. All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining me and listening to the birth story of our fourth child. I'll see you guys next time.